welcome to the CIDCI online salon series. I'm Margie O'Driscoll, and on behalf of the CIDCI Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you here today. The Center for Innovation in the Design and Construction Industry is a not-for-profit organization that relies on your financial support to provide these programs. Thank you to our sponsors who make all of this possible. As the year begins, we hope you and yours are still safe, healthy, and happy. In 2022, CIDCI hopes to renew in-person events in a number of US cities, subject to local health directives. We miss seeing your beautiful faces and hearing you laugh. Stay tuned as we begin to imagine a new way of connecting that will, of course, include a virtual element. If you aren't on our mailing list, please sign up today. And here's an invitation. Please consider participating in CIDCI as a listener to these free webinars or as a sponsor. If your company needs to stay abreast of the latest innovation, and if you want to inspire your colleagues, we're your go-to destination. Today, we're going to be discussing a topic that some people feel uncomfortable talking about, the mental health crisis in our industry. At CIDCI, we believe that sharing and discussing hard topics is the key to developing a healthier and stronger industry. Late last year, Henry Nutt from Southland Industries happened to mention really as an aside to me, the extremely high rate of mental health issues within the industry, especially with suicides. I admit I had no idea that in 2022, uh, in 2020, nearly one out of every six construction workers reported experiencing anxiety and depression. The pandemic has contributed to a global increase in anxiety and depression, but the ac acute increase for those in the construction industry is acutely troubling. CIDCI's intention in hosting this webinar is to shine a light on this issue in a community that can sometimes feel too macho to talk about feelings. We've invited leaders from the Center for Construction Research and Training to share their research on the why and also the ways in which we can all respond and create a healthier environment for everyone. Our speakers today are Chris Kane. Chris is CPR, CPWR's executive director and leads its construction research, training, and service programs funded by federal agreements, grants, and contracts. She's also the director of safety and health for North America's Building Trade Unions, the umbrella organization representing 14 national and international unions representing over 3 million construction workers. Welcome, Chris. Chris is also joined by her colleague, Christopher Rodman, the Opioid Projects Coordinator for CPWR, where he conducts research and designs trainings and finds new opportunities to address mental health issues, including opioid use disorders. Also joining us today is CPWR's Deputy Director, Rick Reinhardt. Rick has worked in public health for over 30 years, researching and building consensus on how to improve the health, safety, and well being of workers and their families. Before we get started, I'd like to extend our deepest gratitude to all of you for this very difficult research that you're doing. Chris, I think you'll get us started. I will, thank you, Margie. And thank you for inviting us to um, do this webinar and hopefully reach some folks that we typically may have more difficulty reaching. So um, I've shared my slides. See if you can let me know if there's any trouble with them. Um, this is our agenda for our discussion today. I'm gonna to give an overview and a little bit of the background about how we became involved in these really serious and important issues. Um, Rick's gonna cover some of the research, what we know about what's going on in the construction industry. And Chris Defer is gonna talk about um, some of the resources and tools that we have available for everyone to use now um, on this. So with that, I'll just get started with the overview. Um, this is a, a graphic that we made out of a report that came out of the Cleveland Plain Dealer um, back in 2017. And we hadn't really known the, understood the magnitude of the crisis we have in construction from fatal opioid overdoses um, prior to this in any kind of numerical way. And this study that the, the newspapers did looking at death certificates found that the rate of construction fatal opioid overdoses is more than seven times the rate for all workers. Um, and also at the same time, we were hearing about a study coming out of Massachusetts where they were looking at the same issue 
and found that the rate of construction workers fatal overdose in that state was um, about six times the rate for all workers. And this really put the lit the fire under what we needed to do um, around opioids. Um, meanwhile, we were starting to learn that our, our workers in our industry, um, we were experiencing disproportionate risk from fatal suicides. Um, what was done? NAB2 is the parent organization of CPWR, um, stands for North America's Building Trades Unions. It represents more than 3 million skilled craft professionals in the US and Canada. And it's composed of 14 national and international unions. The logos on this slide are um, of those unions. I won't go into a description of each one, but it also kind of represents over 330 of what we call building trades councils, which are local associations of local unions who collectively work with employers in the construction industry on a variety of issues. President McGarvey of NAB2, um, when he saw these numbers back in 2017, stood up the NAB2 Opioid Task Force and he asked me to chair it. Um, so I am continuing to chair the task force, which is made up of representatives from all of the unions affiliated with NAB2. And we've also invited, tried to be a little bit strategic, inviting individual employers as well as um, employer reps from associations um, also invited representatives from the Building Trades Councils that I mentioned before, as well as select insurers and a few government partners, um, including, importantly, NIOSH and OSHA, who we work with routinely on occupational safety and health matters. This task force, at its first meeting in January of 2018, adopted a public health model to address the program. And while I'm not a huge fan of this slide, this is trying to describe the public health model that was adopted by the task force back in 2018. And if you look at the bottom of it, where we know we can make the most impact on the, the problem of fatal overdoses in our industry is primary prevention. We're working to prevent injuries at work. We're working to prevent pain at work. Um, these are precursors to a prescribed opioids, and we're going to talk more about um, what we know about prescribed opioids in the construction industry as Rick gets into some of the research. And, and after you think about primary prevention, really trying to cut off the flow of workers who use opioids um, before they use opioids, we're also looking at secondary prevention of once a worker is injured or has pain, how can we provide tools to steer them away from opioids as a way to manage their pain. There's a lot we know now, we're gonna go into um, how, how there's other pain treatments that are more effective. So that's kind of secondary. Before someone develops a substance use disorder and that's really tertiary prevention in our view. And that's you know trying to help workers who have substance use disorders get treatment, um, be in recovery and give them support they need. When you look at where a lot of efforts around opioids stand, they're really in this top tier here. And we believe our work is more in the lower two tiers. We're trying to cut off the flow. Um, there's not a lot of work going on in the, in the lower two tiers in our public health model. So that's where we really focus. In 2020, NAB2 had a convention that has every five years a political convention to elect the leadership. And um, as part of that convention, they pass a number of resolutions. And during the pandemic, it was truncated. There were only 10 resolutions passed that convention as opposed to typically 30 or 40. Um, but one of them that did make the cut was um, a resolution about opioids, opioid overdoses and suicides because the work of the task force obviously um, deals with it. The work is not just opioids, it spills over into suicide prevention and mental health support. So this is something that guides my work at CPWR, my work as NAP2 safety and health director, but also the work of the opioid task force and what we're trying to do. And we've got a lot of elements of you can if you sat down and read this, really righteous things that we need to work on. Um, so we do have somewhat of a roadmap of our path forward. 
Um, however, we have to prioritize. So some of the things that we're prioritizing right now are education and it's education across the industry about substance use disorders, mental health, suicide, but, and reducing stigma about these issues because they're very difficult to talk about. Um, and things like education and how, how to prevent the use of opioids from pain is one of the things. Um, and then we're also looking at some of the tertiary prevention uh, efforts that are underway, particularly within the unions and their healthcare systems. And we're trying to share models of where that works. And we'll talk a little bit more about these tasks a little bit later. One of the things that you know we do want to keep in mind is that really far upstream is how do we change our industry to reduce the pain it causes workers? And I think that'll go a long way in preventing uh, these problems as we go along. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rick and Rick's gonna talk about the research and what we know. So Rick, floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Chris. Again, my name is Rick Reinhardt, and I'm going to discuss some of the research and evidence related to opioid use and construction, as well as on uh, mental health and suicide. Uh, you know, Chris has already introduced important studies that looked at where people who died by overdose and suicide work, and consistently, unfortunately, construction stands out. Um, the findings from these studies have led to a lot of research and actions to address the problem. And following up on the public health model that Chris described, there are still many questions about potential upstream factors related to the construction industry that might be contributing to these horrible outcomes. Um, on this slide is, is one study by colleagues at CPWR that looked at muscular skeletal disorders or MSDs and prescription opioid use among US construction workers. Now, this study was published in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine in November 2020. And it found that more than a third of construction workers reported MSDs with higher rates for construction workers who were older, self-employed, or in poor physical or mental health. And compared to workers without MSDs, prescription opioid use quadrupled among those with MSD injuries. So a previous work our previous CPWR research had already suggested that work-related injuries, including MSDs, were strongly associated with higher prescription opioid use among construction workers. And this slide from a 2019 CPWR quarterly data report shows differences between injured workers, the red bars, and non-injured workers, the blue bars, for being prescribed opioid, non-opioid pain medicine. And as, as you can see by the, the middle set of bars, about one quarter of injured workers were prescribed opioids for their pain. This slide from the same report shows that prescribed opioid use was higher among older construction workers than younger workers. About 14% of workers 50 years and older use prescribed opioids, nearly double the 7.6% uh, for those aged 26 to 34. And, and in the report, uh, the authors suggest that the high prevalence of MSDs and chronic conditions among OP or older workers could contribute to the prevalence or the higher prevalence of prescribed opioid use. So again, in the same study, it was observed that prescribed opioid use varied by health insurance status. Construction workers who lacked health insurance coverage were much less likely to use prescribed pain medicine than those with health insurance. Only 6.5% of uninsured construction workers used prescription opioids. About That was about half of their uh, insured counterparts. You know, and, and this makes sense. You know, If you don't have health insurance, you're probably less likely to see a physician for injuries that cause pain and less likely to be prescribed opioids. So to continue the health insurance theme, Many construction workers lack basic insurance coverage, more so than other industries. And as this slide shows, establishment size or company size is also an important determinant of health insurance coverage. Large companies are much more likely to provide health insurance compared to smaller companies. 
Uh, as the slide shows, in 2018, construction workers and companies with over 500 employees were nearly 2.5 times as likely to receive health insurance through their employment than those in companies with fewer than 10 employees. And the difference is 68.7% versus 27.6%. And on a side note, there is still a lot we don't know about the drivers for workers who seek illicit opioids for pain relief. And lack of health insurance may be one of the contributing factors. CPWR just published another data poll in January 2022, two months ago, on construction work and mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I guess as Margie brought up in the beginning, we all know that anxiety and depression symptoms significantly worsened nationwide during the past two years. And as Chris mentioned earlier, construction workers already suffered from increasing and alarmingly high suicide rates, making it particularly important to understand mental health in the industry. So this slide shows that workers with good, fair, or poor general health were more likely to report anxiety, depression symptoms than those with excellent or very good health. And that's the top row in the slide. It's 18.6% versus 13.4%. Additionally, one in five workers who drank heavily throughout the past year reported anxiety and depression at 19.2% uh, compared to 15.1% of workers who did not. And most strikingly, particularly in relation to my previous slides, Workers who used prescription opioids in the past year were almost three times as likely to report anxiety and depression compared to those who did not. The difference is 38.8% versus 13.6%. Male construction workers have a suicide rate 65% higher than all U.S. male workers. This quote is from a recent or very new CDC NIOSH infographic that is available on the NIOSH website and cpwr.com. Uh, this alarming finding is based on a CDC morbidity and mortality weekly report for MMWR from 2020, which again found that the occupation or the construction and extraction occupation category had the highest suicide rates. In, a, in another study just published in January 2022, in the archives of suicide research. They identified suicide rates by occupation in one state, Utah, and confirmed the construction and extraction occupation category as having the state's highest rate and highest number of suicides. And this study is unique because it was also able, or it also described the hospital history and circumstances of the construction workers who died. For example, it found that 25% tested positive for opioids and post-mortem examinations. A study published last month in the American Journal of Industrial Medicine by colleagues at CPWR's data center focused on psychological distress and suicide ideation, suicidal ideation among male construction workers. And I've listed some of the findings on the slide. Nearly one third of male construction workers in the US experienced psychological distress, and 2.5% reported suicidal ideation in the past year. The odds of suicidal ideation among workers with serious psychological distress were 33 times higher than those having no or minor psychological distress. Workers who are younger, worked part-time, missed work days due to injuries or illnesses, or poor health were at the greatest risk. So th there's a lot more that can be discussed about previous and ongoing research on these topics, gaps in what the research tells us, shortcomings of available data sources, particularly for drilling down the industry and occupation characteristics. Uh, for example, there is often missing data on where people work, their industry or occupation and the conditions of work. I mean, even though most adults spend most of their waking lives at work, many community-based initiatives on these problems do not collect or report data on industry, occupation, or characteristics of the working environment. 
And there, there's even some large population-based surveys, such as the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in the U.S., that stopped collecting industry data from respondents in 2015. And it's not clear why this, this is done, but it greatly reduces the usefulness of such surveys when trying to address a problem such as opioid overdose deaths and suicides in a highly impacted industry like construction. But I want to end on a, a note that goes back to the public health model of prevention, just mentioned in the There is growing evidence that upstream factors or those that fall into primary prevention may have downstream effects on opioid related overdose and suicide among construction workers. However, despite widespread public concern about opioid suicide, and their effects on communities across the country, I would argue that the public is much less familiar with the relationship between certain types of, of work, such as construction, where injuries are frequent and are commonly treated with opioids. As a result, potential workplace-based solutions are not gaining the traction they need to be tested, and if successful, implemented on a broad scale. For example, the bulk of, of Findings and actions to address the opioid crisis are focused on tertiary prevention, as Chris mentioned, on you know, treatment and recovery. And these efforts are you know, obviously necessary and important, but they're insufficient to reduce the problem long term. And it's important for the public to recognize that upstream factors, including workplace injuries and prescription practices for workers, can have downstream consequences of large social and public health problems at a broad community level. So to begin to address this gap, so that we really felt we were having challenges communicating primary prevention to different stakeholders, CPWR hired the Frameworks Institute, a nonprofit think tank that focuses on framing the public discourse about social and scientific issues. We ask frameworks the following question. What communication strategies would be most effective for the public and decision makers to recognize the benefit of primary prevention as part of a holistic strategy to address the opioid epidemic? And through the research conducted by frameworks, some of the challenges they uncovered are listed in the slide. For example, health individualism. They, they state that the public generally thinks of health as the result of individuals' life choices, where they eat, if they smoke, how often they exercise. On the other hand, the social determinants of health or workplace culture and working conditions are mostly off the public's radar. Uh, the next bullet, solutions do not equal prevention, uh, frameworks, stated that you know, for most people, health is not about treating problems, or health is about treating problems, not preventing them, except possibly through diet and exercise, exercise as an individual choice. So this makes conversations about primary prevention difficult. Uh, the public also has difficulty seeing how systems level policies and practices can influence people's mental health and how primary prevention solutions that address physical health can also have positive effects on people's mental health. On many social issues, the public's use, the public use an, an opposition, op, oppositional us versus them standpoint to rationalize way away different outcomes between groups. Uh, this pattern can lead to a zero sum thinking about which populations deserve help, and it's a challenging mindset to face when communicating about stigmatizing issues like opioid use or suicide. And finally, across social issues, the American public shares a deep fatalism about our ability to overcome current social problems. Messages with crisis-oriented language or alarming statistics feed people's sense of helplessness, leading them to dismiss the issue as too big to solve. And this report goes on to outline strategies for researchers and advocates 
to engage the public more deeply and effectively on these issues. And Chris Rodman, who is speaking next, will discuss some of these recommendations. So if you're interested, please have a look at the report on our website. Uh, I, I think it's a, a very interesting read and different from the more typical research on these topics that get published. It's basically you know, on the science of communication and social change. Um, and so for me, it's sort of a, a new area to think about. But thank you, and I look forward to the discussion later in the webinar. And I'll turn it over to Chris Rodman. Thanks, Rick. All right, thanks a lot. Um, well, we really appreciate being here. My name is Chris Rodman, and I'm going to finish up with um, talking about some of the solutions that CPWR has been trying to create. Uh, Rick just spoke about that frameworks report, uh, which was part of our 2020 uh, NIOSH deliverables package. Um, we had a uh, we had the frameworks report as well as an opioid awareness training and a peer advocacy report. Um, these this this uh, Grant was designed with those three uh, three areas of the public health model in mind. Um, of course, that report was on primary prevention with frameworks. In the opioid awareness training, we were trying to hit all three levels of our of um, the public health model. And then the peer advocacy report um, talks about some of the tertiary uh, and secondary preventions that are happening within the unions. So as as Rick previously mentioned, we have the frameworks report. And I, I think what I'd like to say about this is that if, if you have outreach that you are working on, anything on your websites that uh, is gonna be read by the public that has to do with primary, um, primary prevention, um, to please take a look at this report. Um, the report not only gives some solutions for framing these messages, but it also goes through examples that uh, are very concrete and it'll it'll there are three or four sections of paragraphs of making um, you know making a frame you know making a frame around a subject and pitfalls to avoid and then they they will re reframe that paragraph in a different light and say you know use these uh, solutions to make your argument more clear and more and have the public be more receptive to that argument um, you know based on those obstacles that Chris that uh, excuse me that Rick mentioned um, the one that I think we use the most is the upstream downstream metaphor you've probably already heard us use it a few times today uh, but that's something that's very easy to uh, glob onto um, the fact that and, and you'll see that Bill has just shared this in the chat thanks Bill um, but that's something that's pretty easy to think about, I think, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's used a lot in public health, that upstream downstream metaphor that there are things that we can do today that will have a great effect on people down the line. Um, so uh, if, you, uh, if you click on that, you can save that. Otherwise, of course, head to cpwr.com and you can search for that in the upper uh, right hand corner of our website. The second part of our 2020 NIOSH deliverables was an opioid awareness training that was created on behalf of NAB2. Uh, the training is designed to inform workers about opioids, how they work on the body, how construction workers have been affected by opioids, and even targeted by the opioid manufacturers' advertising campaigns. Uh, it shares information how to reduce exposure to op opioids, as well as treatment and recovery modules. Uh, we wanted to make this training to inspire and motivate trainees to act by being more comfortable getting and sharing information about opioids and giving them ways to protect themselves. We know that stigma reduction and normalizing conversations around mental health and substance use disorders goes a long way in helping those who need care. Um, when we reduce stigma, it helps those who are in, in need uh, reach out and get help. Uh, we'll show you in a later slide one of the items that's on the, the program, and it has to do with giving construction workers information on how to have conversations with their care providers about avoiding opioids when possible. This program was in hand in uh, 2020, and we were able to pilot it and evaluate it, and it went from a two-hour program down to a one-hour program. And that is currently available on our website. It's been updated with new stats uh, in late 2021. And thanks again, Bill. Uh, this is just an intro slide from the course, but 
as you can see, we want to, the objectives are to improve knowledge about opioids, including harms and prevention. And we want to inspire and motivate trainees to get action, uh, getting information, sharing it, identifying risk factors, and supporting others. Uh, that, that the supporting others and talking about it, again, goes a long way in reducing stigma, which is a huge barrier for reaching out for help. The final part of the NIOSH deliverables from 2020 was a qualitative assessment of unionized construction's response to the opioid epidemic. This was a follow-up from interviews that Chris had done two years prior, uh, which had given us an understanding of how many of the unions were changing policies, education, healthcare plans, and their member assistance programs to better fit union needs or member needs uh, when it came to mental health and chemical dependency. Uh, CPWR administered key informant interviews with the NAP2 Opioid Task Force members to understand what had changed since those previous interviews um, and how and how um, the unions were combating the opioid epidemic. It, it emerged from these interviews that seven of the unions were using peer advocacy programs in some form or another to help workers who are in need of substance use or mental health interventions. At its core, peer advocacy is a model where a peer worker who has experienced a substance use disorder or mental health crisis will help other workers navigate a path to sobriety by lending their experience and guidance to the individual seeking help. In most instances, this peer is to help the worker find professional resources like the member assistance program that is available to the union members. And our report provides details about strategies, pitfalls, and challenges for existing programs in the in construction trades. It, uh, it gives some background information and key questions to consider in the future. Um, we, we suggest that there's a large scale effectiveness evaluation of these programs. Um, and then we give some other, some other questions that could be asked in, in doing so. I'd like to get into some of the CPWR resources. Um, on the next slide here, um, I just have linked, I have shown the, um, the two papers from CPWR that Rick had mentioned. Um, if you wanna find these papers, uh, please go to our website and I'm sure, I'm sure that they'll be in the chat in a moment, um, but the key finding reports come out quite often and, and you know, these ones talk about the increase in op opioid overdose deaths, opioid use patterns, and they explore mental health symptoms reporting before and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, if you go to our website and just, and search for a data report, those will show up. Um, next slide, please. I think Rick, Rick covered that data um, and I don't need to get into that. So the next slide uh, refers to, uh, gives you some context for some of our other um, resources. So I'd like to give some context into those here. You'll notice that this slide, if we read the graph, um, it shows that a person, it shows the number of days for initial opioid prescription on the x-axis, um, and then the percent likelihood of someone continuing on, continuing to use opioids over the period of time of one year or three years. So said a different way, if someone has an initial opioid prescription of 30 days, there is a 22% chance that they will still be on opioids in three years. If someone has that initial prescription of 30 days, there's a 42% chance that they'll be on opioids in one year. Um, the alarming thing here is that we see a sort of flat line between zero, one, and two, and it very quickly starts to go up. So we say that the risk for opioid dependence starts at a four or five day prescription, and it really jumps after 10 days. Uh, so one of the things that, that we want to point out is that anyone who takes an opioid can become dependent. And there's a fine line between being dependent on your prescription, getting it every, every month from your doctor to help with your pain, um, and then and then, you know, addiction. And it, I should say that addiction refers to the negative behaviors that one engages in to gain access to opioids. And this can be to get high or to avoid withdrawals. 
So for individuals with long-term prescriptions, they are dependent. They would go into withdrawal if that prescription were stopped. So at that point, they're at great risk for addiction. Um, there, if a physician were to stop them without slowly weeding them off the drug, they would immediately experience withdrawal symptoms and they are highly likely to then illegally obtain opioids. So the relief that one gets when they are, when, when using an opioid and stopping those withdrawal symptoms is a very powerful reward. And that's where dependence can easily turn into addiction. So the bottom line is that that exposure to opioids equals greater risk for addiction, no matter what. So the other thing to bring into context here is that opioids are known to be less effective than other treatments. Um, the way to read this slide is we're going to remove the decibel. And we're going to, so what this shows is that if you are treating 46 people with 15 milligrams of oxycodone, 10 people will get 50% pain relief and the other 36 will get less. Um, you'll notice that combining oxycodone with acetaminophen is no better than naproxen alone. And the highest efficacy comes when you combine 200 milligrams of ibuprofen and 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. In that case, 16, if 16 people are prescribed that combination, 10 of them will gain relief from their pain. Um, so in this context, you can see that compared to oxycodone, uh, that combination is nearly three times as effective as getting people pain relief. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a strange slide and I apologize for that, but um, I think it's very important to show that oxycodone alone does not necessarily do any better than something that we can get over the counter. So because of that, we wanna help construction workers when they have an injury, speak, talk to their doctor and say, I'm a construction worker, I've had an injury, I wanna get back to work, but I know that opioids are maybe not the best solution for me. Um, looking back at our public health model, this is a really a level two prevention item. Um, it's, it's trying to, um, give you know, the appropriate non-opioid care for individuals uh, where an injury was not prevented. Um, so in addition to the information on the previous slide, we also know that opioids don't work as well as Tylenol and ibuprofen combined in studies that looked at dental pain, pain after accidents, post-surgical pain, and even severe pain from kidney stones, back pain, and other chronic pain. And of course, we do know that uh, opioids can cause tremendous harm. So this resource is again available on our website and we would hope that people would download it and give it to workers so that a worker can be informed about um, trying to get an opioid alternative when injured. So th this, uh, this next slide features three more resources that we have that are available pertaining to opioids. Um, the hazard alert on the left discusses the three levels of our public health intervention model without specifically naming them, but they are preventing injuries, talking to your doctor about the alternatives when an injury does occur, and then finally, of course, resources for those who are experiencing addiction. Uh, the, the toolbox talk reiterates the, the hazard alert, but in a different format by telling a story and allowing for discussion. Um, you know, these are used kind of a, when the workday is starting, um, some, some construction sites will, will go over a toolbox talk. And you know, these are more traditionally talking about health and safety, but this, you know, the, these are ones that pertain to, to opioids and we think they're very important to use. Again, having people talk about these things, normalizing these conversations goes a really long way in reducing stigma. People are not gonna ask for help when they think they're going to be judged or, um, or help will not be available. Um, finally, the infographic on the right shares some statistics and encourages those who are struggling to ask for help. Um, and of course, so these are these are designed, um, as well as ones on the next slide, you'll see to reduce stigma, like I said, around talking about these, these, these issues. Um, and just as an example, the picture on the upper right hand corner of that hazard alert in a previous version was a bottle of pills, spilled pills, opioids. And we've we found that research shows that, tr that 
images of paraphernalia people using is triggering for those who are addicted. It increases relapse and thoughts of relapse or using. So we have been going through our outreach and making sure that we're changing that ubiquitous spilled pill bottle that I'm sure you've seen quite a bit um, when, um, if, if you've been uh, you know, reading articles or, or seeing things online, um, it's, it's really everywhere. And we're doing our best to change it because we don't, um, we don't wanna be doing anything that's triggering for those who are, who are in need of help. Uh, this is a similar set of resources. So these are, yes, these are uh, our Suicide Hazard and Toolbox talk. They were designed in conjunction with the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. And it created a new framework for talking to someone who was having suicidal thoughts. And it's a simplify, it simplified a previous framework used by CIASP. Uh, the framework itself was being called Reach Out, Respond, Connect. It emphasizes the importance of having a direct conversation with someone about whom you're concerned. And if you are concerned that someone is thinking about suicide, you need to ask them directly, are you thinking about suicide? Research shows that someone who is thinking about suicide will often be relieved when they finally have someone to talk to. This, this subject is so taboo and stigmatized that people often think they have no one to turn to. And so if someone's able to ask that question directly, they know they have someone in front of them who's a safe person. Um, the respond portion refers to how we can respond when someone says they are thinking about suicide. Um, listening without judgment is the most important thing and not steering them in a way that thinks that may, would make them think you don't want to talk about it. The biggest indicator could be saying something like, oh, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? That's much different than the direct question, of course, which, which is, are you thinking about suicide? Um, and you're supposed to reassure that help is available and connect them with help. This can mean calling 911, taking them to emergency room, or if, the, if this is a non-emergency situation, you can have them uh, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Toolbox Talks, again, reiterates this, uh, but it again, tells a story and it can be discussed among workers. These are two infographics that also have been created in conjunction with the um, Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention, um, and they are directing people to call the National Suicide Prevention um, Lifeline, and hopefully would be used, would be put up in workplaces and used in conjunction with the toolbox talks. So finally, if, if you need any more information, I would just invite you to go to the CPWR website. Um, if someone you know needs, needs treatment, we have access to the SAMHSA treatment locator. Uh, this is a very, very useful tool where you can find substance use treatment or behavioral health treatment. And it can be, there are multiple ways to search. You can search by geographic area. You can even search by your insurance um, system. So you can be sure to find a treatment provider uh, that is in, that can be paid for by your insurance, which is obviously very helpful. We link to the National Suicide Hotline phone number, as well as the, the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. But uh, you'll see there's other links like NIOSH and CDC as well. Um, it's, so if you want to find those, I'm sure Bill's putting in the chat, but if you go to cpwr.com and Google mental health, uh, it'll be high up in the search results. Next, I'm gonna to pivot to just talking about the current efforts that CPWR is undertaking. Uh, we're working on some mental health activities as well as a bullying prevalence survey. The, mental health activities uh, were born out of the opioid awareness training that was mentioned previously. Um, the, as I had said, it, was, it had originally been two hours um, and it needed to be shortened to an hour in order to be useful for the, uh, the um, unions who had, who had been part of our pilot. Uh, but at the, the time it was recommended that a separate mental health training uh, was, was, um, you know, was um, gonna be designed. Um, and when, and so we were, we started off with a similar training, PowerPoints, didactic, uh, but when we were researching kind of this in a background capacity, uh, we learned that mental health training and especially suicide awareness training, it was apparent that that lecture didactic model um, doesn't necessarily foster the kind of behavior that we're trying to teach. And really what that means is that an environment where someone can reach out and talk to a peer for help, um, or talk, or that a peer could talk to another peer 
about an issue they're having in a non-judgmental way um, needs to be done through conversation. And that if we're trying to teach conversation, we need to have conversations. Um, so instead of that didactic model, these are discussion-based activities um, that can be used uh, you know, on an as-needed basis within um, you know, training, trainings, apprenticeship trainings, or if there's trainings with uh, journey level people as well. Um, the, the, this is something that we want people using. It's been piloted a few times now. We've had some good feedback and we're getting to the point where we're gonna be putting this out, um, making a full design and it should be available on our website within the next few months. Um, and again, I've already said it, but you know, we know that when people start talking about these things, normalizing behavior of talking, stigma is, is reduced. And that of course, is a huge barrier to people getting help. So the next, the next slide pertains to our bullying prevalence pilot. Um, when researching the mental health module activities, we came across studies that showed workers who are bullied have higher rates of suicide, excuse me, suicidal ideation and depressive symptoms. We also know that apprentices are the most likely target of the workplace. This inspired us to do key informant interviews with the NAPTU Apprenticeship and Training Committee members in order to understand if bullying and harassment is perceived to be a problem in the apprenticeship programs. And so far we have learned that it's, it is considered to be a significant issue in the industry. It's reported that it leads to poor working environment, environments on job sites for apprentices and that every year apprentices leave programs as a direct result of bullying. As you can see some of the stats there, we know that bullying is associated with double the suicidal, uh, suicidal ideation and an increased risk of depressive symptoms. Um, and we know that, and this was a very disturbing, um, disturbing statistics for me, but that younger workers' risk of dying by suicide is higher than non-construction workers of the same age. Um, this came out of Australia. We don't have stats for this for the United States, but if there's a similar trend in the United States, the, I would say that this is something that's been buried and in that it's kind of hidden in the data. Um, and so I think that there's also this is something that should be should be looked at in the United States. Um, what they found in Australia was that while older construction workers have a high um, a high risk of dying by suicide, that risk is not not significantly different than older workers um, who are non-construction. Whereas those younger workers in construction were much more likely to die by suicide than uh, another non-construction worker of the same age. Um, so finally, I have one more slide. The bullying prevalence survey pilot um, is being, it's actually live right now for the next few, two weeks. We've partnered with an international union contractors association and group of apprenticeship training centers to pilot this. And after the pilot, we were going to be administering a full survey, um, but we're currently learning about if the, if the you know, survey questions are working well and that people are, are you know, answering them in a way that, that makes sense and that they understand what the questions are. Um, so that we, uh, so that we know that our, you know, that our data we get is, is, um, worth looking into. Um, uh, but the, the reason that the, the, this, uh, entity wanted to, um, partner with us is because they're creating diversity, equity, inclusion curriculum, as well as anti-harassment training. And they want to, you know, have an understand of understanding of what's going on in their union so that they can better, um, better create those trainings. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm done and we can go go to questions. I'm sure you all have questions for, for either myself or Ricker or Chris. And thanks so much for having us. We really appreciate your listening today. We're so grateful, uh, first of all, for the work that you're doing um, and also for you sharing this really important research with all of us. Uh, we have a question here from John Gall, uh, which is, is CPWR working with the LAP-C program? If so, how? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. We are, we, how can I say this? I've worked directly with our local chapter of LAP. It's Labor Assistance Professionals. It's, a, it's an incredible nonprofit. Well, I don't even know if they have staff. Um, it's an incredible effort by individuals from within the labor movement who work to support their peers. Um, in recovering mental health issues and the like. And we know that a lot of our unions in the building trades are working 
with LAP through local chapters, but also participate in national conferences for education purposes. It's kind of like a lay person's employee assistance program, not at the professional level, but it's say a construction worker um, being trained up to provide support for their peers. And it's a, a wonderful program. Um, I would say of the unions who are involved in peer support programs, 100% of them are working with LAP. So I hope that answers the question. Um, you can find them on the web. And um, if there's anyone from the labor movement who's interested in getting more involved in this type of work of supporting uh, your brothers and sisters who need help, that's a great place to start your, your journey in education. So. Thanks. We, we actually flag some of that information, John, in the one of the reports that was mentioned, which was the one we did on peer support in the building trades unions. So that lab is talked about in the report as well. Um, we have a question from Sandy Lender, um, which I think many of us have been wondering, which is, could the panelists share ideas along with reducing stigma for a company to reassure employees who may be struggling with um, a substance abuse challenge that they won't be placed out of work? Um, a concern is that workers who test not clean cannot operate heavy equipment and so on. How do we assure those workers they won't be fired if they come forward and can be supported and helped? Well, I'll, I'll take the first step at that and maybe Chris can, um add to it because he's been doing some exploration into recovery from the workplaces, but that's kind of like a movement that's happening. Different groups around the country are looking at this idea of what is a recovery from the workplace for someone who has a substance use disorder and what steps can employers do. I think the first step is identifying the policy at the employer level um, of what you will do if someone on your team has a substance use disorder. So with that first step, um, I know we have some colleagues at the University of Was Washington University in St. Louis who are actually working on this for construction. So stay tuned. They're, they're looking to release an employer guide on recovery friendly workplaces. But I don't know, Chris, if you wanted to add to that on some of the recent work you've been involved in. Um, Chris, I think you said it pretty well. The, the main thing would be establishing that workplace policy and then sharing it. Um, if people don't know what the policy is, they're only, you know, they'll be talked, they'll think it's something else, but being very clear and transparent about what the policy is, um, that, that people can use, use maybe their um, employee assistance program to get that help and that, um, that the, you know, primary, primary, you know, goal be to getting them to treatment. Um, but yes, there's, there's many different policies, there's many different ways of doing it. Um, and, and I do hope that that, that report comes out soon so we can share it. Yeah, we'll definitely share that but, once yeah. it's ready. But the main item is not, you know, not being, n that we're not, um, that no one's in trouble, right, for coming from coming out. No one gets reprimanded. No one loses their job. Um, and I think one of the best ways to think about that, too, is when you when you fire someone for a substance use disorder, you're just passing around the industry. Um, you're not helping them. And it hurts. It hurts everyone. It hurts, you know, and it hurts people's bottom lines as well. Um, but if you put someone... I've said enough. All right, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, Susan Moss uh, asks about um, DEI um, and the research that you're doing in connection with bullying. Um, it, uh, are, are, are there any statistics or differences uh, based on ethnicities, race, women? Um, has your research gone that deep? Uh, no, not yet. We're, we're at the beginning. We will we'll know more. And we'll certainly be sharing that information when we have it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, uh, as um, I was preparing and talking to people about this webinar, uh, one of the one of the common responses I got from people was that, well, you know, the construction world is a really macho industry. Uh, you know, that people on the job don't want to be, uh, don't want to say, I'm, I, I can't lift that, or or I'm in pain. And um, it, it's a it's a broader issue that's related to our, our self identity sometimes of, of who we are as as individuals. And I wonder if you have any um, thoughts about how um, how that might impact um, the reluctance of people to come forward when they have uh, when they're struggling with issues. I'd, I'd like to take that one. You know, we just 
gosh, this week had a conversation with a colleague in Australia who's been looking at suicide prevention in Australia for a number of times. And he said something that really stuck to me and I hadn't thought about it in this frame. You know, we did our framework research to talk about how to pr promote solutions, but you know, how do you, how do you, struggling to talk to construction workers about in their own um, language and, and, and how we work. And it was really interesting that um, this gentleman talked about um, construction is workers often see themselves as protectors and providers, um, typically to their families. Um, they provide, in, in particularly in the unionized construction sector, a very good solid income to their families, health insurance, pension, they protect their families um, in many ways. So the idea of, of thinking about how you can talk about mental health issues as being providers and protectors of your brothers and sisters with the tools. Um, it's just another way to think about it is that you don't necessarily have to say, I have a problem. You basically say, how are you doing? Do you, do you have a problem? Do you need any help? And, and it's not as much about trying to encourage the way that, that this gentleman was framing their approach in Australia is it's not as much about how to encourage people to seek help, it's how to encourage construction workers to lend help and to be there for each other and to learn how to talk about it in a destigmatized way and be that productive protector and be that provider of your colleagues. So I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. And it, it has great resonance with me. Um, so, you know, we'll be thinking about that as, as our work continues. That's a, a really beautiful and poetic way to end this session. Um, on behalf of the Center for Innovation in the Design and Construction Industry, I can't thank you enough for your, first of all, the research that you're doing, this really hard work, um, uh, and also um, sharing with, it with us has been so profound. Um, you've really shown a light on, a, on this crisis and helped all of us think about how we can better respond as a community and as an individuals. Um, I'd also like to thank today's sponsor in this conversation, AI California, and also acknowledge uh, Shani Gomez, um, who's uh, listening in, uh, who, did, who really helped me frame the conversation and really begin to understand the issues in the industry over the last few months. So with that, uh, we're concluding CIDCI's online salon. This session will be recorded and placed on our website and YouTube later today. Please join us for future webinars and be sure to subscribe to our newsletter on our website, CIDCI.org. Next Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific time, we'll feature a webinar on an entirely different topic, knowledge management in the age of collaboration with Chris Maroff. Special thanks to Katie Olson for keeping us on track and to all of our sponsors who make this possible. Thank you for joining us. And as always, if you have thoughts or comments, please reach out to us via CIDCI website's contact us link. Thank you.